Uh, Professor Barry Keisler has been one of our favorite political science lecturers for almost 20 years. Uh, you, some of you may be aware that he has a question about Middle Eastern politics, and his courses on the Middle East are always very well received. If you have the opportunity to take one, grab it. Dr. Preisler received his undergraduate degree in biology and chemistry. He was young at the American University of Beirut. His work for his master's degree at San Francisco State focused on the Palestinian resistance movement and the Arab governments. And his doctoral work at UC Berkeley was on Lebanon, the rationality of national suicide. We are very fortunate to have him in our department, and we're very fortunate to have him here today to speak about the origins of anti-Semitism in Europe. Professor Price. In 1894, France's military high command became aware that the Germans, their potential enemies in any future war, had obtained crucial French military secrets from a spy that the Germans had somewhere high up in the French military, indeed in the French army's highest command organization, the General Staff. The French military elite, the generals, focused on one man and one man alone. His name was Alfred Dreyfus. Based on what would later be shown to be forged documents, Dreyfus would be convicted of treason by a military court in proceedings held behind closed doors. Dreyfus, the real spy, a man by the name of Walsen Esterhazy would continue untouched and unchallenged to leak secrets to the Germans, thus continuing to undermine the real security of France. However, the military court, the French military court, was unanimous. The French military hierarchy was also unanimous, and interred what appeared to be a unanimous French public condemned Dreyfus, condemned this man who was innocent of the charges of treason, but condemned Alfred Dreyfus was the fact that he was a Jew. Dreyfus was indeed an officer in the French Army's general staff. His was the highest military position a Jew had ever achieved in the French Army. All of this happened in France, the birthplace of the Enlightenment, the source of the French Revolution and its ideas that it spread through Europe and indeed through the rest of the world. That revolution had proclaimed the equality of men, the principles of justice and fairness that were meant to be universal, the Universal Declaration that all men have certain fundamental rights. That universal equality and fairness explicitly included Jews at the time of the French Revolution for these French revolutionaries. That revolution was 1789, just about 100 years before the Dreyfus trial. And yet here in France, 100 years after the French Revolution, the old prejudice and hatred of Jews that the revolution had, in a sense, tried to legislate away seemed to have found new expression, new political purpose. When suspicion of a spy arose, the answer seemed to be, for both military and for too much of the public, of course, it must be the Jew. And as much as the main line of this particular story is about the injustice done to a man because of his race or religion, 
It is also, I will argue, fundamentally about the division of all French politics, not just at that time, but continuing to today, and indeed, as I will argue, I think, of all modern politics. The Dreyfus Affair laid bare the fundamental divisions of French politics in 1894, and I'd argue that those divisions continue to this day. I'll be arguing that basically those same divisions divide the world to this day. Dreyfus himself was the epitome of what I shall describe and discuss later as the assimilated Jew. He was completely assimilated, successfully integrated, largely secularized Jewish person. His family's Jewishness, if you will, was of the thinnest kind. One could hardly be more chauvinistically French, more militaristic, more un-Jewish in the stereotypical sense than Alfred Dreyfus. But again, when suspicion of treason arose, much, if not all, of the public sentiment in France, much, if not all, of the press, of the newspapers in France, or at least what I shall start to call the right-wing reactionary press and public, were absolutely sure eventually, regardless of evidence to the contrary, that it must be Dreyfus. It must be the Jew because he's a Jew. In their eyes, despite all the outward appearances and attitudes that Dreyfus carried with him as an individual, for them, for these types of people, he was not really French. What the Dreyfus case illustrates perhaps better than any other single event prior to the rise of the Nazis in Germany 40 years later was the rise of a new form of an old prejudice, an old bigotry against Jews, the rise of anti-Semitism as a new form of the old hatred and prejudice against Jews found in Christian countries. Now, however much this topic may be out of place in this course at this time, it is perhaps as well to have it here. As we have tried to ponder how the Nazis' motivations and strategies evolved to the policy of exterminating an entire people, it is evident, or it should have become evident, that starting with the Nazis, starting by trying to look at the mind of Adolf Hitler, even the young Adolf Hitler, simply does not offer enough of an explanation of what happened or how the Nazis rose to power. Most particularly, Germany was not the birthplace of anti-Semitism, nor was it up to and even including the beginning years of the Nazi takeover, nor was it the most extreme example of an anti-Semitic state prior to that Nazi takeover. The story of the rise of anti-Semitism needs to be understood as part of a broader European phenomenon which started generations earlier. That story is clearly not a happy one but it is an extraordinary story. It tells us about not just the hatred focused on one people, but a great deal about our whole modern era of politics. And ironically, this story of the rise of virulent anti-Semitism, of virulent bigotry, it is a story that begins as a story of liberation and hope nevertheless one that plants the seeds of dashing those hopes. It will be a story of paradoxes. Now, however much the bigotry and hatred that lay behind the popular condemnation of Alfred Dreyfus seem to be simply a typical page in the history of anti-Jewish hatred and persecution 
that have been going on for centuries, literally for thousands of years in Christian countries. As much as it seemed exactly the same kind of phenomenon again, what happened in France in 1894, more broadly, what had begun to appear all over Europe in the decades just prior to the Dreyfus Affair was distinctly different in its character and in its political purpose from the anti-Jewish bigotry and persecutions of the past. It was so different that a new name had to be invented for it. People at the time recognized there was something distinctly different about this form of bigotry against Jews. They recognized that its, char its character had changed and they invented a new name for it. Anti-Semitism is a phrase, is a word that was not, did not exist prior to about the 1870s. In the past, more precisely before the French Revolution, before the Enlightenment, but in particular before the French Revolution, persecution and hatred directed towards Jews by Christians was inspired by religion, expressed almost always in religious language, and pursued using religious themes, even if theologically speaking, these themes amounted to nonsense. When persecution of Jews, again prior to the French Revolution, became the order of the day in previous centuries, something that would achieve some temporary political or economic advantage for Christian political or social forces, the language used to spur that persecution invoked religion. Most commonly, most commonly when Jews came under attack, the rallying cry was to punish the Christ killers. Supposedly, the Jews are responsible for the death of Christ. The murders of Christ or to claim the Jews were secretly desecrating Christian symbols, such as the crucifix or the host of Holy Communion. None of this, of course, had to be true or to make any sense. What it did do was to serve the temporary interest of political powers of the past, interests that are, of course, achieved entirely at the expense of Jews. But again, in, most importantly, the idiom the language, the themes they used were religious themes. And as long as it was defined in religious terms, since it was defined and expressed almost exclusively in religious terms for a Jew or a Jewish community, it essentially offered no realistic hope for the Jewish people to ever escape from this other than to stop being Jews or to disappear from Christian lands. There is no reconciliation, even potentially, if that's the nature of the bigotry. However, the anti-Jewish persecution and bigotry that arose in the late 19th century, again, getting towards that Dreyfus case of 1894, had a distinctively different character and certainly a different idiom and a different political role. Even though it would obviously draw on the older traditions, the older religious anti-Jewish bigotry, the new anti-Jewish themes would be, if you will, more secular, meaning less religious, to match the more secular age in which it was being used. The language and style of this now anti-Semitism would focus more on racial differences and incidentally only on religion. It arose precisely in an age in which many, if not most Jews, did not look different, did not act different, did not live fundamentally different lives than the non-Jews around them. I'll elaborate on that as I go on. Just to give you a feel of the difference, less religious character of this new anti-Semitism, 
listen, if you will, to the following passage. It is a speech given before the British Parliament in 1903, given by a British Prime Minister. He, makes, he made these statements to justify why he opposed opening Britain's immigration doors to Jews who were fleeing persecution, where they were suffering persecution over in Eastern Europe, basically in Tsarist Russia. There were human beings in need of haven from persecution, and the British Prime Minister was telling you why he didn't want to open British doors to those Jews. I quote, a state of things, if Jews were allowed into the country, could easily be imagined in which it would not be to the advantage of the civilization of the country, of England, that there should be allowed into the country an immense body of persons who, however patriotic, however able and industrious, however much they threw themselves into the national life still, by their own action, remained a people apart, and not merely held a religion differing from the vast majority of their fellow countrymen, but only intermarried among themselves. These were the words of Arthur James Balfour. Perhaps some of you may know him in another context. His statement was denounced at the time, quite accurately, as open anti-Semitism against the entire Jewish people. But note its character. Religion is only incidental in this defamation of the Jews. Their sin, their unacceptability as human beings, is that they remain a people apart by their own action. And this, as far as Balfour is concerned, and many who backed him, they did block those doors to opening immigration, condemns them and makes them unworthy of being granted haven from persecution, of being treated as human beings in need of help. Now, if there is a fundamental change in the nature and character of discrimination and bigotry against Jews, by this time in history, the question is, how did this change come about? How did the religious anti-Jewish prejudices of the past become the racial anti-Semitism of the modern era? I know some of you have taken my class, and you will not be surprised to hear that it all started with the French Revolution as almost everything in my class seems to start with the French Revolution. Jewish life in Europe prior to the French Revolution, 1789, about 100 years before Dreyfus, almost all across Europe, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Jewish life in Europe prior to the French Revolution had been characterized by an arrangement of exclusion or seclusion, segregation from the Christian societies around them. The urban Jewish ghetto, isolated community life in Poland and in Eastern Europe, in those cities and towns more broadly, but even in the countryside, in the agricultural communities, those were segregated Jewish <coughs> agricultural villages, not mixed Christian and Jewish, but Jewish villages, the, so, the so-called shtetls, emphasized that Jews would live in seclusion, isolation, without contact, without major contact with the broader Christian society. This segregate, segregated and basically self-contained community life was more or less the norm, clearly for Jewish life in the predominantly Christian countries of Eastern Europe. And Eastern Europe in the 1890s was where the vast majority of Jews in Europe could be found. The greatest absolute number of Jews was in Eastern Europe at the end of the 19th century. This isolation or segregation of Jewish life from broader Christian life was at its best a policy of coexistence without much contact. At worst, of course, at its worst, 
It led to an easy target of concentrated populations of Jews if persecution of Jews became the political or religious policy of the day for the people and governments surrounding them. The life of Jews in Western Europe was also characterized by exclusion or seclusion from their broader societies. If there's a, if there's a major difference, the main difference was the Jews in the West were a much smaller proportion of the overall population. There just weren't as many Jews relative to the rest of the population in the West. And Jews in the West lived almost entirely in cities and towns, not too much agricultural Jewish community life. The main point to emphasize here is that prior to the French Revolution, Jews lived for the most part on the periphery of Christian society. They were not mixed with or integrated with this broader Christian society, either in the homes and neighborhoods they lived in or in the occupations they were able to pursue. Now, this did not happen by chance. There was some self-selection, but it was not just self-selection at all. It was either legally or socially mandated for them in their countries of residence. In fact, in an enormous range of political particular circumstances, Jews were legally excluded from broader integration or participation in their broader societies in the surrounding Christian world. And I need to make extra efforts, emphasis on this because it will contrast so profoundly what, with what will happen later on in the 19th and 20th and 21st century. They were secluded. They were not part of the broader society. By law, in essentially every Euro European society, Jews were banned from holding public office. Jews could not hold government jobs in the government bureaucracies. They were not allowed into the schools and universities other than ones that they could create for themselves. They could not serve in the army. They could not serve in the police forces of almost any Christian state. They were barred, simply barred, because they were Jews from most professions such as doctors and lawyers. And again, in contrast to what will follow, because of all that, just simply banned from almost all those categories of occupation or integration, prior to the French Revolution, hardly any Jewish person had had a major impact on European politics, on law, on medicine, on philosophy, on the arts, on music, or on culture in general. Think about it. How many Jews were famous prior to the French Revolution in broader society? Again, by contrast with what we'll see beginning in the 19th and well into the 20th century. When did this start to change? It changes rather suddenly. All of this started to change with the extension of the ideas of the Enlightenment through the French Revolution. It was clearly there in France, but it was spread parad paradoxically beyond France with the military conquests of Napoleon across Europe. The principles and ideas of the Enlightenment led directly and explicitly to what is called in Jewish history the emancipation. Changes in law were put into effect, literally liberating Jews from many, if not most, of the previous restrictions and barriers that had barred them for, from participation in broader European life, not only in France, but across Europe as well. All of a sudden, those barriers were lifted, were destroyed. Emancipated Jews, after the French Revolution, were now able to enter the professions, to enter the army, even in principle to rise through personal ability to the ranks of officers in the French army. Jews now had the opportunity, or at least faced no legal restrictions, to participate in the political and intellectual life of Christian Europe. Jewish individuals, at least in the West, could move, and many, many, many would move from the periphery, from the exclusion from broader European civilization to a concentration in the intellectual and cultural life of Europe 
to the intellectual and cultural capitals of Europe, Paris, Bordeaux, Lyon in France, Berlin, Vienna, Warsaw, and others. Jews would become, in a strikingly short time, not just participants, but preeminent contributors to the intellectual, cultural, economic, and political life of what continued to be basically Christian societies. It's a stunning event in human history, at least on paper. If you think about what are these French revolutionaries up to? What are they about? It's their motivation. I would argue that the motivation for the legal emancipation of Jews did not come from new, some new attitude, some new friendliness or sympathy for Jews on the part of French revolutionaries. I met a Jew and he was not a bad guy. Maybe we should get rid of these laws. I don't think it happened that way. I think it flowed logically and inexorably from the heart of the Enlightenment principles that they espoused. I keep using that phrase. If you out there do not think you know what the Enlightenment principles are about politics of the French Revolution, I think you do. Americans should be familiar with a paraphrase of exactly those principles. It became part of our political history. That all men are created equal. That each and every person is endowed with certain inalienable rights. It is not just Thomas Jefferson, it is not even just John Locke and the English Enlightenment tradition. It is the Enlightenment ideas across, especially France, but all of Europe. The emancipation of the Jews was part and parcel of the liberation of all men from the arbitrary and from the perspective of the Enlightenment radical, the French Revolutionary radical, from the arbitrary and irrational distinctions imposed upon men in the past, be they based on religion or claims of special birth or traditional distinctions that make no sense anymore. All men would be liberated from those arbitrary distinctions and it followed logically, it applied to everyone, Jews as well as others. Thus, what had been prior to the French Revolution, prior to the Enlightenment. Political societies defined in a major way by its religious identity, a Catholic France, a Protestant England, a Catholic Spain or Poland, began to change that identity for its now citizens, previously subjects, to a greater or lesser degree, to a less religious, more secular political identity, which tended to be based on common language, common sense of shared history, common customs from the past. It came to be called nationalism. We are all French people together. No longer was a common person's major political identity defined even as the subject of a king. Who are you? What is your political identity? I'm the subject of Louis XVI. I am the subject of this aristocrat. No longer was an individual's most important political identity that of being a Catholic or Protestant. It had been. It wasn't going to be that way anymore, at least if the French revolutionaries could have their way. The French revolutionaries sought quite consciously to reduce or eliminate the role of religion in politics in the public realm. They knew, as so many other Europeans knew, that France had suffered profoundly from the religious wars, the era of religious war, the fratricidal wars where Catholic French and Catholic Protestants would kill each other, and German, French, uh, German Protestants and German Catholics would kill each other. When the French revolutionary armies abandoned slogans such as vive le roi, long live the king, they replaced it with vive la France. Long live France, long live the country of France, but much more to the point, long live the people of France. And in order to have a single people, a united nation, religious identity simply had to be removed from any importance 
for political affairs. Religious identity and practice had to be relegated to the private area of each, the private affairs of each individual. You can be a Catholic, you can be a Protestant, but keep it at home. Do not let it enter politics. That, that's the promotion of not just nationalism, but of a secular nationalism was the plan and immediate outcome for the French people in their revolution. And it was not just a secular nationalism, we're all Germans together, we're all French together, we're all Irish together. Irish will pick up on this. But it was inspired by the Enlightenment's emphasis on the rights and liberties of individuals. That was the conscious goal of that revolution. Now, the downplaying of religious <clears throat> differences as a basis of any political or legal distinct distinctions it was going to be the case for Protestants and Catholics in order to achieve the successful unification of the French people. From exactly the same principle flowed, once again, logically and inexorably, the removal of political or legal distinctions based on religion for religions other than Catholics and Protestants, for religions other than Christians. That is, the principle followed for Jews as well. The emancipation decrees aimed specifically at the Jews followed logically from the general principles of the French Revolution in regard to religion. And because they did that, and because of this, if you will, rational consistency of thought, what that did was open the way, really for the first time in the history of Jews living in the diaspora, Jews living in non-Jewish lands for the civic participation of Jews as potentially politically equal and acceptable members of France, as well as of the many European states, which at least initially enacted their own more limited versions of emancipation decrees. All this was true, at least in theory, at least on paper, to be a citizen and politically active in France, one need only be a Frenchman, not even necessarily a Christian. And thus, the way was open for the formerly excluded Jews to enter broader civil society as Frenchmen of the Jewish religion, Germans of the Jewish religion, just as a Protestant, a Frenchman of the Protestant religion a Frenchman of the Catholic religion. It follows from those principles. Thus, you had the basis, the spreading of Enlightenment-inspired political and social legislation allowed for the integration of Jews into broader non-Jewish society, most dramatically in France, less and less so as one went further geographically away from France, from the French Revolution and its direct influence. All this, the spreading of the Enlightenment, held out, which you can call what has been called a great promise. It held, it seemed to hold out a great promise, a great hope. That hope was that 2,000 years of religiously inspired persecution of Jews by their surrounding Christian societies might be changing, might even someday end entirely. The hope, the expectation was that with the spread of education, with the spread of democratic political structures, with the spread of the reason that was the philosophes magical stone, magical idea. It was not only Age of Enlightenment, the other name, the Age of Reason. Use your reason. Do not deny your reason. That the spread of reason as the basis of how we would organize our societies, not tradition or we don't know why we organize our societies the way we do, spread of reasons, of reason, that the philosophers of the Enlightenment promised would give us a better world if all of that took place 
it seemed, the Jews could look forward to a day in which persecution because of their distinctive religious status might come to an end. This was the hope. Now, even in the basic approach of the emancipation logic that I've outlined, there was a problem. This first problem that I identify is a relatively benign one, if you will. A quid pro quo was built into the system that presented most Jews with a dilemma, which was by no means a minor issue, even if it wasn't on the level of a life-threatening persecution, as it had been in the past. In order for this emancipation idea to work and for Jews to live reasonable lives among Christians, in order for emancipation to work, in order for this experiment to change or to help Christians to evolve on their part to tolerance and acceptance of Jews among them, Jews were expected to do something. They were expected to assimilate. And by assimilate, I mean that, new, that now that they were beginning to mix in everyday life, they were integrating, they were mixing with Christians, they were basically, their part of the deal was to look and act and dress and pretty much live their lives in a way that was essentially indistinguishable from the Christians around them. You don't look or act any differently. You don't look for different kinds of food. You don't look for different ways of dressing. Religion for the Jew was going to be privatized the way it was supposed to be privatized for the Catholics and Protestants. Religion was going to be made into a private affair. This is another way of describing that the goal was a secular society where religion in public was, or religion was not meant to be public, was meant to be private. For Jews in particular, they were expected to go, to privately go to their worship on Saturday or privately say their prayers or pursue their other religious practices in private. Publicly, that is among the rest of society and for the rest of the week, they should look and act like everyone else. There's a reasonable logic to that. To the degree that you don't look Jewish, your religion is not carried around by the, what you're wearing then the people you meet or pass in the street who may harbor some of those old anti-Jewish religious prejudices, these people will simply either not know that you are different or will clearly have a chance to forget about religion in their daily affairs and interactions with you. Again, potentially it's not, it's almost a benign thing. Think of how many immigrants how many of you are second, third, third, fourth generation Americans? Think of how many immigrants over the years coming to the United States make a point as their own idea of looking and speaking and acting and eating just like every other American, to get rid of their differentness and be the same with everyone else. It is not unusual to act that way so that your integration in the broader society is more benign. So if this assimilation strategy. It was just look and act like everyone else option was all it took to be accepted in American or European society. If this assimilation strategy in principle opened enormous opportunities of intellectual and cultural, political and economic advancement, then it would seem, it would seem to be not too big of a deal, certainly if you're not Jewish. Seems like it can't be a big deal. And for at least many Jews, not all, at least for many Jews, it was clearly an option chosen by many Jews from that time forward to today. However, despite all these positive implications, all these positive benefits, if you go that route, potentially if you go that route, for some, some Jews it was a big deal, a very big deal. And this was the case for many Jews who considered that it was exactly how you dressed, how you ate, what days or hours of the week you could or could not work. 
It was exactly those things that defined you as a Jew, not just as an ethnic custom, but religiously. If you gave in on these issues, especially one after the other, if you gave in on these issues, perhaps one by one, working on Saturdays, eating non-kosher food, maybe going away to a university where your environment might be completely non-Jewish seven days a week, and of course dressing like everyone else, these concessions might chip away at each individual Jew's identity, his or her Jewishness, in a fundamental religious sense. How did the Jews react? The Jewish response to this dilemma in the century after the French Revolution ran the entire gamut. Many Jews embraced the opportunities of emancipation by assimilating wholeheartedly and basically never looking back. Many other Jews assimilated but had to deal pretty much their whole lives with this contradiction to be a Jew but not to be a Jew. Don't do the things that make you a Jew but nevertheless somehow retain your Jewish identity. And of course, some Jews simply rejected assimilation entirely, the entire range of possible responses. A point, I'm gonna go back as a footnote here, a point should be made in regard to the special, the typical social segregation of Jews in ghettos and shtetls in the pre-French Revolution, the pre-Enlightenment past. For all the negative images of segregation, of forced isolation from broader society, the one undoubted positive aspect of segregated, isolated Jewish life was that this dilemma of assimilation simply did not exist. If your entire social environment was Jewish, all of them more or less structuring their public actions and behaviors according to proper Jewish religious norms, then there was no private public contradiction in being a good Jew. Jews seeking to remain secluded from the broader society would, under this interpretation, if you wanted to continue that way, you don't have to have this public-private distinction that really doesn't make enough sense to you, then you would continue with the isolation, you would continue with the segregation by choice. And in that interpretation would be something like the Amish community or other Christian sects who have intentionally, voluntarily secluded themselves from broader society by choice, rejecting what other, whatever material or economic advantages that broader civilization might offer, and instead, instead insist that a proper religious life is to be had only as a community and by your public, not just your private actions. So that is at least a problem, assimilation and what it meant for the Jews in sacrificing something about their Jewishness. It is an issue, but it is one that you can deal with. However, all this hope, all this promise, there was a bigger problem. And this one was not a benign problem. And this bigger problem would work continuously to undermine the great hope for Jews that was supposed to come with the emancipation, with the legal lifting of restrictions on Jewish life. All of this carried with it what turned out to be an unfounded hope, a false assumption that these enlightenment ideas, these hopes for a better future, for a rational future for mankind, would spread automatically and would spread inevitably to the rest of the world and dominate the rest of the world politically. Reason and true knowledge, and by true knowledge, I mean the kind of knowledge that mankind was starting to get from the rise of modern science, the scientific revolution. Here's real knowledge, really important things that were proven and not just the texts of Aristotle or Ptolemy or Aristarchus from the past most of which was nonsense in terms of what it told us, in terms of knowledge. Real knowledge, true knowledge. Let's build our societies based on a scientific view of how to put things together properly. The assumption was that reason and true knowledge would inevitably defeat and replace the ignorance and superstitions, the irrationalities of the past. Certainly, this was the basis of the hope of the Jews for a better future. The persecutions and oppressions of the past 
because of a religion coming from a prejudice based on ignorance, superstition could be expected to disappear in a world that was becoming more and more secular, more and more based on reason and true knowledge. That's the hope. Unfortunately for human history in general and for the Jews in particular, there's a glitch in that story. These themes, these principles would not automatically win the battle against its opposition. They would not inevitably prevail against the political and ideological forces arrayed against it. Almost from the first days of the French Revolution, the political forces of almost all the existing powers in Europe, to mention just a few, that is every single other government in Europe, all of them based on monarchs, monarchies, aristocracies, joined together in an almost unique instance in history when was the last time all the countries of Europe united together against one other country previously? They would unite together to crush this revolution. Because if you're a monarch, you're an aristocrat, the basis of your power is precisely that all men are not created equal. You are different. You are special. That's why you rule. And here's somebody saying that's nonsense. They join together to try to crush the revolution if you will, the elitist reaction from day one of the French Revolution. Edmund Burke, the Anglo-Irishman, would reflect on the revolution in France, his famous work, Reflections on the Revolution in France. He would reflect on the revolution in France and condemn its excesses, not as a bad application of basically good ideas, don't you want true knowledge, don't you want reason, no. He would condemn the ideas of the Enlightenment, all of them, as pure nonsense bound to produce bloodshed. Not good ideas, poor application, but bad ideas. That's why the French Revolution was bad. He would condemn the ideas of the Enlightenment as pure nonsense. Reason and true knowledge were not his heroes, but his villains. Burke would be the first to set in motion the ideological attack against reason itself as the ideological foundation of the political forces that would oppose the French Revolution and the Enlightenment from that time forward. The attack against reason itself. To a greater or lesser degree, the anti-rational foundation would be at the heart of all the political forces and movements from that day to the present whose basic posture is a rejection of the French Revolution, a rejection of the Enlightenment. Edmund Burke's work, in its most benign sense, is considered the defining document of classical conservatism. Less graciously, it would be the first of what would be a long list of diatribes and rantings against the Enlightenment, and in particular against the major political outcome of that thought against democracy itself. For the next hundred years, arguably all the way until the present day, the political divide within the modern world can be characterized as those who are or were for the French Revolution, but most particularly for the Enlightenment, for real democracy, very simply, rule of, by, and for the people, in particular the common people, versus those who reject democracy, the outcome of the Enlightenment. Rule, <clears throat> those who reject democracy altogether, or those who ex accept an illusory or showpiece democracy which hides the reality of elite dominance and rule. I don't know if you guys know this term, but in the 19th century, the anti-French revolutionary political forces across Europe had one common name that lumped them all together. They were called reactionaries. This is a term that has gone out of vogue, but I'm going to use it. The whole spectrum of those who had one thing in common, their opposition to the French Revolution and its ideas. The implication here is that one could meaningfully 
generalize across time and space in the 19th century, at least in Europe, and place those who share this anti-democratic, anti-common people, anti-reason perspective as a way to characterize what went on at that time, and arguably it carries over to the present in what we would today recognize as basically anti-democratic political movements and leaders and ideologies today. The anti-French revolution forces, the anti-common people forces, were by no means limited to the aristocracy or the monarchs of Europe. They're clearly at the forefront of the opposition at the beginning. Others would come, would also share the antagonism to the French Revolution, and eventually these forces would be found together regularly on the same political ideological front. In particular, the church, the Christian church, clearly the Catholic church, unfortunately, but also to only slightly lesser degree, the Protestant church could not accept the enlightenment premise of the basic natural goodness of man. That's one of their beliefs. We are not basically evil. The source of evil is not inside human beings. As almost every religious tradition, certainly the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition, the source of evil is inside of us. No, people are basically good. It is almost impossible for any of the religions to really accept that premise. And they could not help but react to the implication that the so-called superstitions and in irrationalities of the past that were to be overcome in the new age of reason and enlightenment amounted to an attack on the Bible and, e and indeed to revealed scripture of any major religion. A very powerful element, the church, basically set against the French revolutionary principles. Similarly, the army certainly in France, and to a large degree almost everywhere else, is the most undemocratic institution in French society, and again, almost anywhere else. Most often, the military was dominated in its officer corps, if not its rank and file, with elitist aristocratic elements, with little, if any, commitment to a government above them that was democratic or pursuing the interests of the people. To this list of anti French revolutionary forces might be added at least some of the members of the new ruling class of the capitalist industrial era, the bourgeoisie, the capitalists. This class then and perhaps now was reconciled to going along with the illusion of democracy if it happened to show up, but might pursue every means possible to have their own interests domin dominate over those of the democratic masses. These reactionary, anti-democratic political forces were there from the beginning in the French Revolution, the birthplace of the revolution. They continue up to this present day, and I'm not making that up. In 1989, that is the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution. I think it's not dividing French society today. In the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution, about half of France refused to celebrate including notably the town of Arras, which is the birthplace of the French revolutionary leader Robespierre. Most towns that have a famous local boy that made good or made a name for himself here, make a big deal about him. Arras has no statue to Rose Robespierre and refuses to celebrate his birthday or the French Revolution. It still divides, divides France to this day. If you're anti-French revolution, however, there is a difficulty, there is a special difficulty. Whether you like it or not, the French Revolution brought in a new era of, a new style of politics. Political power wasn't just control over violence, it was control over people, or the followership of people. To a large degree, politic, political power became the political power of having lots of people with you, voting for you. And that was just as true for right-wing reactionary forces as it was for those who embraced the French Revolution. And it would seem that those who have embraced the revolution, which tended to be the working class parties, the leftist parties, 
the liberal parties, all of those who seemed to go along with the basic premises of the French Revolution, they had an inherent advantage. They were pro-democratic. They were speaking about the interests of the people, and the common people should join those parties. It would seem they would have an absolute advantage in getting masses of people behind them. Again, if it comes to the point where democracy has evolved to where almost every adult can vote, which happens pretty much by the end of the 19th, early 20th century in most of these places, then those kinds of parties should have just an inherent advantage. They argue for the interest of the common people. These basic elitist, basically elitist institutions are at a complete disadvantage. For these reactionaries, a way had to be found to lure common people, working class people, but maybe especially lower middle class people away from the political program that was so simple that proclaimed that common people interests, the interests of the majority of the people should be paramount. They had a problem, these elitist reactionary forces, in coming up with an alternative that could possibly win the loyalty of, it would have to be thousands or millions of people. If you're going to win political power by some kind of democratic means, and that's what's coming up, or even maintain power, you needed lots of people. How do you pry the common people away from these movements that seem to obviously re represent their interests rather than yours? How do you garner enough support from these lower middle classes to prevail in the political contest of the world of mass-based politics? Long introduction, sort of the end of my introduction. In the way I have presented the problem and discussed it, I think the answer, at least in outline, if you're still with me, might be seen as obvious. Promote a mass ideology that rejects reason, that takes issue with science, which promotes and sustains itself on fear and ignorance and glorification of the irrational. As it turns out, its appeal will be most profound. It will not work very well among the industrial working class, among the proletarians, but it will work relatively well among what is vaguely referred to as lower middle classes. The elements of this mass ideology and the mass-based parties, parties that will pursue its irrationalist themes would be found essentially all over Europe by the end of the 19th century. If you, if you have already read about Nazism or perhaps fascism, I've just described the foundations of Nazism. But this is long before Nazism or fascism, the Italian fascism that gives the, the movement its name, have even appeared. They, have a, they appear essentially all over Europe by the end of the 19th century. They will not get a distinctive or accurate name attached to it until the 20th century. And the name that, we, that I will attach to it is fascism. We first hear that word, that term, that description, fascism, in a particular place and time. After World War I in Italy, when Benito Mussolini creates the fascist party. And now we use that as a generic term for all of these movements that have those same features in common. Other versions of it didn't call themselves fascists. Over in Spain and in Portugal, the name that they used was Phalangist, the Phalangist of Spain and Portugal. In France, a party that never took power but nevertheless was fairly strong, the Phalange. And of course, in Germany, the equivalent party called themselves National Socialists, the Nazis. All of them had in common, all of them had this in common, a fundamental anti-rationalism. Indeed, some observers of this ideological movement have characterized it as the great anti-ideology. They had an easier time describing what they were against than what they were for. All of these variations of fascism would be stridently anti-democratic, hysterically anti-communist, and of course, fundamentally anti-rational, irrational, anti-rational.
that fundamental irrationalism carried clearly to its rejection of science as an alternative source of knowledge, at least to any science that did not produce knowledge that was needed and dictated by fascist leaders. I would argue that this tendency continues to this day to wage war against science that produces knowledge that is inconvenient to them against facts that are again inconvenient to what they want against, if you will, a war against the truth. Now, despite the fact that the name fascist and the fascist movements which became so important were 20th century movements, it's still the case that most, many if not most of fascism's elements were already to be found throughout much of Europe in the last part of the 19th century. So we have an era of fascism before the name fascism has been invented. Among the many antis that would bind them together, the one that was easiest, the one that actually named their movement was not fascism. The thing that bound them together was the movement of anti-Semitism. Not just I feel like I don't like Jews, but an anti-Semitic party, a league of anti-Semites. That was the anti that bound more people together than any of their other antis. The great tool of the reactionary right wing in the battle against the pro-French Revolution parties, that is against basically the leftist working class, center-left political parties, that would be used against them to discredit them, to rally, unfortunately, the political support of masses of common people who would otherwise perhaps have leaned to the left the great tool of the reactionary right wing would be anti-Semitism. Why? Why? Just think. It was precisely the parties of the left, those most committed to the French Revolution and the principles of human equality and the rights of all men, who would accept Jews into their party ranks, into their organizations, precisely those movements that brought the French revolutionary idea that we are all human beings first and foremost. In particular, we are all Frenchmen, we are all Germans. Those movements would be the ones who would allow Jews, precisely because they believed in human equality. For the right wing, it was a tool to discredit the communists, the left wing movements, the left wing parties, the working class parties because of their Jewish membership. For the proto-fascists of the time, they could argue that your movement was full of people who were not really French or not really German, not really American. A few decades later, in the 1930s, Jews would be again targeted as not really German, or at least certainly not really Aryan. And thus, because of that, an evil blight on society, and more specifically, it would be characterized as a threat to the real Germans, to the German people. And thus, communism and Jews would be used interchangeably as the tools of those not just in the Nazi era, but before that time, to try to discredit the common people parts of the political spectrum and for this, if you will, fascism. The newly integrated, newly assimilated Jews of the post-French revolutionary era turned out to be perfect targets for this fascist ideological line. Jews were now part of the public life of Europe, quite often in positions of leadership, where they simply were never to be found before just a few decades previously. And especially in a society which changed from a past where, privilege, where <clears throat> privilege was based on heredity, to one in which privilege or reward was supposed to be based on individual merit, under that new principle of advancement due to individual merit. Many Jews were not simply mixing with the broader populations, 
but excelling in competition with it. The success of so many a Jews <clears throat> in advancing themselves through their individual merit would create a source of friction, a source of backlash, if you can associate it with American events as well. A backlash by those non-Jewish members of society who did not advance by individual merit, who did not do well, if you will, on standardized exams, to those for whom the promise of reward for individual merit meant nothing because they might not have any individual merit. And such people tended to be concentrated heavily in what I've called the lower middle classes, the petty bourgeois, small shopkeepers, small business and petty officials, and their families. They have a chance to rise through their own individual merit. What if they don't? What if they have no individual merit? The envy of Jews by members of this class in particular, the lower middle class, is part of the explanation of why fascist parties have been inordinately identified in the bulk of their membership by the lower middle class. And this thesis should not be that unfamiliar. Individuals who are basically failures can blame their failures on others. The good jobs and good positions are being given to people who are not real Frenchmen, not real German, not good white people. There's another tact. Jews will get it both ways in this era. There's another tact by which Jews will unfortunately be too well placed in receiving the bulk of this irrational hatred and blame. What I have described so far has been Jews economically, from economically meager and educationally de deprived backgrounds rising to gain higher position in wealth and celebrity, influence, and all the rest of it by their merit. This type will be the envy of those who have not managed any such advance for themselves. However, there is another type of Jew who will become, if you will, too well known from an entirely different type of irrational hatred. This was the figure of the Jewish capitalist of the Jewish banker in particular. Anti-Semitic writings of this era and propaganda are filled with the image of rich Jews, Jewish bankers, who because of their extraordinary wealth and close access to political power, were actually ruling the world in a not-so-secret conspiracy. Anti-Semites would argue with special reference to Jewish banking families that they were by their nature loyal to no state. They can't be real Germans, real Frenchmen. They are not loyal to any single state. They had family connections in all states and were thus inherently disloyal and unpatriotic in any of the states they happen to reside. So if you're a lower class Jew making it up, they condemn you. If you are an upper class Jew and being rich, you are picked out among the upper class for approbation and not the other people who are rich. Unfortunately for all Jews, one well-known Jewish banking family seemed to fit exactly this description, the Rothschild banking family. This enormously important banking family had branches in every European capital by the 1850s. There was one major war in Europe in the 19th century, the Franco-Prussian War, the Prussians defeated the French very quickly and easily in 1870. When the Germans, when the Prussians and French got together to work out the consequences of the French defeat in monetary terms, the financial ramifications of the war were worked out by the major banks fa financing the French government and the major banks financing the Prussian government, two branches of the Rothschild banking empire. The Rothschild banking family example would be twisted all too easily to the image of an international Jewish conspiracy in control of world affairs. This would be a common proto-fascist and eventually Nazi anti-Semitic theme, a fascist theme throughout Europe. I have characterized a good deal of what anti-Semitism was all about 
and its connection to the broader fascist political forces that arose in Europe. I'd like to return for my final comments back to the Dreyfus affair with which we started, but first reconnect explicitly with this broader course, with the Genocide and Holocaust lecture series. We have read and heard until now about the special circumstances of Germany that led to the rise of a stridently anti-Semitic party, the Nazis, how it started with attacks on Jews, they began to rule that way, then the increasingly public denunciations and threats against Jews, followed by more and more deadly attacks. But all of this discussion focus tends to work under the assumption, which turns out to be wrong, that these conditions were either unique or unusually the case characteristic to Germany of the 1920s and 30s, and they were not. I've been arguing that strenuously now. The Dreyfus Affair, as opposed to the Dreyfus Trial, which was over almost immediately, it was a quick trial, but the Dreyfus Affair went on for years. It lasted for years because of the efforts of extraordinarily heroic people, people like the French author Emile Zola and the French political leader Georges Clemenceau who eventually become president of France. These leaders and the larger and larger numbers of people who came to support them waged an incredible and heroic and unbelievably dangerous battle to have Dreyfus retried and acquitted. Anti-Dreyfus, that is anti-Semitic thugs took to the streets at this time with pretty unambiguous slogans such as death to the Jews, attacking not only Jews, but any of those trying to defend the Jew Dreyfus. Again, 40 years before the stormtroopers are doing the exact same thing in the streets of German cities. Those attacks included even attacks on Zola himself, on Clemenceau himself, and on their homes. True to what would be a fascist pattern, these street gangs were not spontaneous but organized and coordinated by leaders of organizations who called themselves the League of Anti-Semites. Again, if you're going to call yourself something you haven't invented fascism, they're comfortable with the anti, the anti-Semitism. Violent gangs of thugs took to the streets of innumerable cities across France with this very unambiguous slogan, death to the Jews. One example among many that could be described, an anti-Semitic leader of Algiers. If you know where Algeria is, it is not part of France today. It used to be part of France, cosmopolitan France, across the Mediterranean in North Africa. At least some French background people that live there plus the Berber and Arab population. But there <clears throat> was an anti-Semitic leader of Algiers, the capital of Algeria. His name was Max Regi. He rallied his followers, his thugs, with the call to water the, the tree of freedom with the blood of the Jews. He managed to get elected mayor of Algiers, and immediately upon taking office, he launched his thugs on a murderous attack on the Jewish community in Algiers, killing many, destroying Jewish shops, torching Jewish synagogues. Does that sound familiar? It should sound familiar. Hmm? Uh, yeah, why not? It should sound exactly like Kristallnacht, essentially exactly like Kristallnacht, it's tech, except it took Hitler, what, six years before he orders Kristallnacht, and this happens almost immediately. If anything, the anti-Semitism and the lethal attack on Jews happens even quicker in the French context of, of the 1890s, even quicker. 
And the slogans I've selected for you, I'm not sure if you can come with more bloodthirsty slogans than those. I don't think the Nazis could top those. It's all there, if you will, if there are stages in the movement towards genocide. At least looking back, it looks like Germany, except an accelerated version of Germany. The Dreyfus Affair is famous or infamous for bringing so much of all this that I've discussed out into the open at that time and in that place. But if there was ever an event that has two almost exactly opposite interpretations emerging from it, I believe it is the Dreyfus Affair. Some saw this as a cup half empty. Some saw it as a cup half full. Many would see what went on, these thugs in the streets, and they're attacking, well, there's actually not many Jews in the streets, they're too afraid to go out, but attacking those who would defend the Jew. Some saw this as the cup half in empty, that is understandably as in the most negative and frightening light. In particular, at least some Jews saw what was happening in France, the home of the revolution, the home of the Enlightenment, if it happens there, then it seems to be unambiguous evidence that the great hope of emancipation was a false hope, that assimilation was doomed, it would not work, that some other solution to the Jewish problem would have to be found because Jews would never ever be accepted in Christian society. Cup half empty interpretation and a significant movement among Jews went that route. However, there is an, an extraordinary cup half full part of this story. Alfred Dreyfus would be released. He would be exonerated in a very unsatisfactory manner, it's true, but nevertheless, he would be exonerated through the actions of extraordinarily heroic individuals like Clemenceau, Zola, and others who acted with him. And it wouldn't just be leaders speaking out in Parliament. These would be masses and masses of the citizens of France. And almost every one of the people of the masses who marched in the street at that time in support of this man's human rights were non-Jews. The Jews of France at the time of Dreyfus made essentially no public protest on behalf of Dreyfus. It may not be hard to imagine that they were terrified to do so. Clemenceau would lead a popular, if you will, democratic movement that would be made up overwhelmingly of non-Jews who would achieve a partial victory, at least a temporary victory, against the forces of unreason and reaction of fascism their action was not an action, it was not defined, their banner was not to, to protect a Jew, to defend and help a Jew. That would make no sense in itself and could not generate a mass movement, I believe. Clemenceau's rallying cry, just imagine what it would be. Clemenceau's rallying cry that almost miraculously garnered greater and greater Popular support was a simple one. A French citizen, a human being, had been denied justice. His basic human rights had been violated. A denial of any individual's human rights is a denial of all human rights. That was his rallying cry. And this is quite literally none other than the principles of human equality and basic human rights at the heart of the French Revolution. Somewhat less abstractly, Clemenceau also told his followers to look for themselves at the anti-Dreyfus, anti-Semitic political forces of France. They were exactly the monarchists, the aristocrats, the reactionary elements of the Catholic Church and the army whose core was dominated by aristocrats who had always opposed French democracy who had always sought to undermine what was now the Third Republic, 
the first, second, third republic, who had always opposed all of the French Revolution. Look at who's arguing this. That's what the real story is. And they were using Dreyfus, they were using this Jew in their effort to destroy, once again, French democracy, to bring down the Third Republic. The political storm that arose in France against Alfred Dreyfus was an assault not just against Dreyfus, not just an assault against Jews, it was an assault of this, if you will, of the reactionary fascist forces of France against democracy, against the Republic, and against the egalitarianism and equal justice for all that was what brought those elements together in the republics of France. Seeing that way, the political assault against Dreyfus was nothing less than the assault against the French Revolution. And it was the political forces of France who saw themselves as defending not just Dreyfus, not just a Jew, but essentially those revolutionary principles that achieved at least a temporary, but nevertheless extraordinary victory against the opponents of democracy and human rights. Okay. If you've been hearing what I'm saying, sit or reflect for a minute. Almost half of France arguably an awfully brave half of France, is marching in the streets in what looks like an effort to free an unjustly accused Jew. One hundred years earlier, it is inconceivable that any such thing could ever happen. And yet, okay, it's a half full cup. Not all the Frenchmen have bought into this. About half of them haven't. Half of them never have. But half of them have. And the fact that Dreyfus is a Jew is for them not the important issue. The issue for them is that there is a human being whose rights have been denied and they will act to protect the rights of another human being that have been denied. Let me con conclude with just a couple of observations. One is that the Jews tragically took on the role of being the target of the hysteria and irrationality at the heart of the fascist phenomenon. However, this choice is not indelibly linked to Jews. This choice might be coincidental, if tragically so, for Jews. As one <clears throat> astute observer of the fascist phenomenon has observed, had the Jew not existed, then the fascist right wing would have needed to invent him. You might look around you in the world in general, you don't even have to look around the world in general, you can look around the world in America. And see if there are others who condemned without trial, if you who are universally, who, those who are universally defamed, automatically considered to be unacceptable and undeserving of the recognition of their human rights. And then you look closely at those who are doing that defaming. Look in America, look in the rest of the world. Second and last point on this, final points, has to do with a question that comes up, came up last year, came up this year, it should come up inevitably in a course that is considering the issue of genocide, the mass murder of whole peoples. If genocide is the possible or the eventual outcome of forces like these, if in fact some of the indicators are unambiguous, if you have a Kristallnacht in Germany after six years of Nazi rule, or a Kristallnacht in Algiers after a few days of the rule of a, dis of a demonstrably anti-Semitic party, what can be done to stop it? If we have stages, I think it was Professor Laporte, Laporta said, once it's started, it's essentially impossible to stop a genocide. How and under what circumstances, how do you stop a genocide? How do you stop something? I think what nobody has ever looked at in this case that I've just given you, Algiers or France at the time of Dreyfus, is a stage in the direction of what could have been, instead of the Armenian genocide, instead of the Nazi genocide, could have been the first genocide of the 20th century in France.
of the last genocide of the 19th century. It had all the earmarks of mass murder without mercy. How was it stopped? It was stopped. Do we have, you know, people have asked me in section at different times, is there any example of a genocide that's been stopped? And again, once it started, it's almost impossible to stop. But I would argue this is exactly what I've given you here. We don't know where France would have gone, but it looks, from what I've described to you, like it could have gone exactly the same route that Nazi Germany had gone. It looked exactly the same in those first stages. What stopped it? Something like a movement getting people out in the streets who are unafraid, who are heroic, and indeed arguing exactly the right principles of human rights and human dignity. It might not work, but that's how it might have worked in the 1890s in France. And that is the origins of anti-Semitism in Europe. Thank you. Now I can see you. Um, yes? What could have happened in Germany? How would you characterize that? What could have happened in Germany that could have stopped? Well, we know what it what could have done. It. OK, it is, um, if what I described was, if you go with my argument, it was successful in France. It actually worked. In Germany, what could have worked? Well, I think exactly the forces of the left if they had somehow been able to win the street battles. Or more particularly, if, some, if the forces of the left had been supported and the Nazi forces had not been supported from outside as well as within. It's not inevitable, but I think that would be the structure of how you stop it. It might not win. It's not an obvious winning formula, but if it's going to win, it would have to be something like that. If you say what we need to do is go out and demonstrate to protect the rights of Jews, or not the rights, Jews that are being oppressed, I don't think you'll get many people out on the street. It has to be broader. Human beings. Human beings are having their fundamental rights denied to them. And that's what might get people out on the street. And I think that's exactly what worked. There was street battles. The Nazi thugs literally beat the daylights out of the communists, and they were not as good at using pure violence as the Nazi thugs. And that helps them to get to power and get rid of the effective opposition to what they were moving to do. And yeah, I, that's what it would look like. Maybe it's especially difficult in the German circumstances. Again, there was no guarantee that Clemenceau was going to win that battle. It's, I kept calling it miraculous. It sort of works. It's not a done deal. But I think it would have to be along that position. If you ever see these people, you know, like they came to get the Jew, and I wasn't a Jew, therefore I didn't act. They came to get the priests, and I wasn't a priest, so that I didn't act. I'm messing up that paraphrase. But um, if it's other people that have their own categories, and I'm not part of that category, I'm not going to act. Well, you just get rid of the categories. A human being is having his rights, her rights denied or an entire people having their rights as human beings denied. And that might get you at least an effective mass-based force that would have a chance to stop people like the Nazis. Um, do you think that also France is going to start persecuting the opposition communists? Um, because they're going to be the first major Jews, while in France there's a large opposition that why do not have the population to collapse their OK, uh, another comparison with France. Um, do you think the Nazis were essentially much quicker and more brutal in destroying their opposition? Uh, my guess is that's probably true. And yeah, maybe the Nazis learned from Algiers in 1894 and they didn't pull any punches. The first people that they jail are not, I mean, there's some Jews, but the first people they throw into what were then called concentration camps without its horrible negative connotations were communists. Those are the people that have a real chance to stop you, not the Jews, the communists. I mean, we know that there weren't that, really that many Jews in Germany, about was it, half a million Jews in Germany. So it's not a big portion of the population. They really are a small number. 
They cannot act on their own. You almost can wait till later to take care of them. The real opposition that you have to worry about are the parties of the left that can garner, that can get thousands and thousands of people into the street in principle. You beat them into submission. And it, and it becomes easier if you happen to take over the power of the state. Yes? Uh, what about the nature of the original anti-Jewish feelings? And since it was so clearly religious in its idiom, in its purpose, in its leadership, um, it became a tool of religious or you know, political leaders or religious leaders who, for their purposes, are going to find a way to distract everybody. It's the Jews that are our problem. Let's get rid of the Jews. So I, you know, very briefly, that's it's it's sort of a different phenomenon. But even the name Semite, what is Semite? It's a racial characterization, right? It's not a religious characterization, it's a racial characterization. I know a bunch of Arabs that when they're called anti-Semites, they have a tough time with that one. So look at, we're Semites, Arabs are Semites, Jews are Semites, Arabs are Semites. Europe, Europeans or the, whoever is this anti-Semite at that time probably doesn't care or even know an Arab, but they do know Jews. So Semite seems to be the right racial category. But now, today, are the Arabs anti-Semitic? Got to think of a different word. Got to think of a different word. They don't hate themselves. Um, it's assuming that the circumstances are fairly special. Clemenceau, in particular, is a significant political leader, and it's sort of an internal affair, and he manages it as an internal French affair. But let me qualify. I didn't tell you, this is when Clemenceau is very early in his career. He's not the president of France at all. This is where he makes his name. He is not an official leader of almost anything. He is simply a major leader of a party, of a... You know, not even, you know, he's not the big man of French politics. Because he becomes so famous in this battle, he eventually becomes the president of France. But that's way in the future, 1914, World War One. He's not there yet, so it's not a particularly big or pre, you know, pre-existing power structure that can work different forces. He does it as an extraordinary. Zola is a, a novelist. And it's simply the prestige of Zola. He's the most loved novelist in France in his, in his late lifetime. He is considered a, you know, a national treasure. And this guy comes out very famously condemning the government, condemning the military, condemning the church for the support of all these people. So it's a lot of sort of individual prestige people who are doing it. Nevertheless, it, 
if you're on the outside looking at this, um, it is quite true at the time that there was an enormous amount of world attention focused on France and focused on the Dreyfus Affair and focused on what was going on. I think Clemenceau and the other pro-Dreyfusard forces were helped by that, unquestionably helped by that. If there was a general consensus outside, just imagine the, the people outside of France and America and the rest of Europe that are paying attention in particular to this are probably the more educated, the more liberal left, and they are going to be pro-Dreyfus, I believe, most of them. And they will be expressing their opinion to the French about how unacceptable what they're doing is. So that, I think, helped them in some sense in getting support. I don't know enough details of like money and, and foreigners that come in and march in the streets with them, how much that was part of the story. But uh, unquestionably, I think, help from the outside, support of any and condemnation of the government can influence what they're up to. Again, who knows? Um, certainly the Turkish genocide that you guys read about, the, if you will, the, the preliminary genocide of the 1890s against the Armenians were about, what, 150, 200,000 Armenians are killed, uh, is a dry run, is a, is a practice run for the full-scale genocide of 1915. Um, a lot of pressure was, was aimed at the Turkish government by all kinds of people saying it's unacceptable, we're going to give you trouble. And they had to be paying attention to that. And they probably stopped short, they stopped short of where they wanted to get in 1890s and then they found the opportunity when nobody could do anything about them finishing the job in 1915. So outside world pressure, yeah, I think that's, I mean, just imagine what you're up against. If they're anything like the Nazi state, then you've got one heck of, an, uh, of a political force to try to stop. Yes? Um. Ah. Another lecture, I think. Um, I mean, obviously, things are happening. Um, the rise of anti-Semitism, but almost what I'm more focused on, or at least what strikes me as something that is even more frightening, um, is the rise of anti-Muslim reaction. If they're attacking people. It's just clearly wrong. You don't attack people for what they writing and stuff like that. And if you kill them, it's completely unacceptable. And the anti-Muslim thing, is I'm, I'm imagining that to be more lethal in the long term than against Jews. But nevertheless, Jews might, at the other end of the spectrum, also be under attack. So um, I think we're, we're facing exactly that kind of uh, world right now. And it doesn't necessarily have to be Jews that are the ones that are discriminated against. Um, you know. When, we, when I gave you that, that character portrait of assimilation and people just, you know, Jews looking like everybody else and you don't, you don't even know if they're Jews, I mean, just what's an example of a country where a lot of that seems to go on? Well, sort of France, but how about... No, I'm talking about Jews. Jews that have assimilated and you can't tell the difference. Yeah, I mean, we are. We are sort of indistinguishable, most of us here. If you are not part of the Jews that wanted to assimilate and you want to look different and act different and live a more complete Jewish life as you see it, then you tend to self-segregate, you know, in Manhattan or something like this. They are Jews, they are going their route, but for so many Jews, integration in the broader society is what it's all about. And it's been in, embraced and it's generationally there for so many Jewish families in America and many Jewish families in the Western world. Yes? But in addition to what you rightly described as anti-Muslim sentiment in France and in the rest of Europe, is that what sets this current wave of anti-Semitism in Europe apart from its predecessors is that much of it is driven by Muslim immigrants. Muslim immigrants, sure. sure. Um, okay, okay. So, 
I'll make the question broader. Besides the specific events in France this, this last six months, what about the question of anti-Semitism in more recent times, in particular after the creation of the State of Israel? At least some people will describe any criticism of the State of Israel, its policies, its leaders, as a new form of anti-Semitism. That's clearly a debate among Jews. There's a real problem with that. It is not people living among other people and whether they're treated equally. It is a criticism of a government. It may not be a nice criticism, but it may be an absolutely legitimate criticism. Are you being anti-Semitic to be very critical of, let's say, Benjamin Netanyahu in a speech before Congress? Could you be a perfectly non-anti-Semitic person, but nevertheless think that was absolutely unacceptable? If I'm a Jew or non-Jew, is that anti-Semitism? I sort of doubt it. If you are, in particular, if you are critical of the state of Israel and you're a Jew, where do you put that person? You're in a bind there, since there are so many Jews that are critical of the policies of the state of Israel. They, you have to invent absurd categories. An anti-Semitic Jew or classically and a self-hating Jew. I know some of these Jews that are critical of the state of Israel, and they, I've asked them, do you hate yourself? And they say no. So that one is a meaningless nonsense term. It is pretty clear that you can be Jewish in every sense of the word, but still be critical of, of Israel's policy. It's a little bit like, can you be a real American and criticize the American government? Can you be a real American and criticize what American soldiers did in Iraq? I don't see any real Americans criticizing our boys. Um, no, no. You can criticize exactly what American government does and be, consider yourself to be a true patriotic American. Maybe not a certain other element. With, they'll condemn you as supporters of international communism, international terrorists, and so forth, if you say anything critical of the American government. So you have to be careful of that particular version. What about anti-Semites today? The classic anti-Semites, the ones that don't want their daughters to be marrying Jews, and the ones that really don't like Jews, they don't want a Jew to move into their neighborhood. That kind of anti-Semite. How do they feel about the state of Israel? Are they automatically opposed to the state of Israel? Actually, it's a whole different lecture, folks, but let me give you a little insight. When I, when I said some Jews, literally a famous Jew, attended the Dreyfus trial, and what he saw was a cup that was half empty. What he saw was, as far as he was concerned, he came from Austria, he said, this sh sh just says emancipation isn't working. Assimilation is a false hope. Jews must find a different solution to their problem. And that Jew was a man by the name of Theodor Herzl, and he created the modern political Zionist movement, which is the movement that eventually leads to the creation of the State of Israel by 1948. He saw assimilation as a false hope. It wouldn't work. And his great insight, he said, and he did, and his organization did, don't fight the anti-Semites. Don't ask them to be tolerant. Don't ask them to change their attitudes. Tell them you agree in all their stereotypical characterizations of how bad Jews are for the broader societies they live in. And I'm not making that up. You go to von Plev, the Russian minister in charge of the pogroms in Russia, as Herzl did. And he comes away from this as everything von Plev said, I agreed with all of his characterizations of how bad the Jews are living among Russians. Bad for the Russians. You don't argue with anti-Semitism. You try to find common cause. How do you find common cause? Here's how you find common cause. You say, I'm not asking you to merit, you know, to let them come into your country club or move into your neighborhood. Actually, I'm asking you to help me to get Jews to leave your country and go somewhere else. Will you support that? And you know what? An anti-Semite can endorse that one 100%. You want my help in moving Jews out of my country? 
you know, I'll write the check today. Anybody know who Arthur James Balfour is? Mm. I brought him up. In 1903, he is the quintessential anti-Semite. In 1917, he will issue what are the mo one of the most famous documents in the history of the State of Israel and of Zionism, the government of Britain expressing its official support for the creation in what was then Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, the fundamental British imperial support for the creation of a Jewish colony, which will eventually become a Jewish state. They call it national home, but it's meant to be a Jewish state. Is Arthur James Balfour a, a, an anti-Semite, a profound and sort of virulent anti-Semite in 1903, but a nice guy that likes Jews in 1917? I don't think he's changed one iota. You ask him, can Jews come into Britain as a haven from persecution? He says, absolutely not. If you ask him to help Jews to go somewhere else, he's 100% supportive. There is that element of anti-Semitism and a whole movement that tried to turn the most negative of relationships into a positive one. It does not help assimilation. It does not help the Jews who continue to live in Europe. It did not help the Jews who continue to live in America. It arguably maybe helped Jews that wanted to move to Palestine and create a Jewish state. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you.